there is a power on this earth which has existed for hundreds of years. It has altered the way we live, has moved mountains, changed the course of rivers, shaped the outcome of wars, and forever changed the history of humanity. That force is the corporation. In the 21st century, corporations are the lifeblood of modern civilization. Their impact is felt in almost every activity of human endeavor. Corporations control what we eat, how we communicate, and how we travel. From the time we are born, while we are children, and even how we die, corporations play a role in almost every aspect of our lives. Billions of dollars electronically flow from one corporation to the next in a blink of an eye. And although corporations are not allowed to vote, the political process has often been manipulated and even guided by the hands of corporations. Today, corporations practically know no boundaries, and they have been forces for human advancement as well as disaster. Thanks to corporations, we have witnessed incredible advances in almost every conceivable technology. However, if left unchecked, corporations have the potential of committing irreparable harm to our planet and its inhabitants. In order to understand what a modern corporation is today, it is imperative that we understand the origins of where they came from. So let's go on a journey through time and space to find out how the corporation of today got its start. The first corporations appeared in the early 17th century in Europe, where monarchs gave the corporations a specific public mission in exchange for the formal right to exist. The corporation was conceived of early in the colonial era as a grant of privilege extended from the monarch to a group of investors, typically to finance a trade mission. The establishment of the corporation limited the liability of investors to the amount of their investment, a right that was not granted to ordinary citizens. The corporation served the interests of both the monarch and the investors because travel to the New World was anything but a safe investment. Ships of the day often encountered dangerous hurricanes, where many were heavily damaged, cargo was destroyed, and lives lost. In addition, the European powers were constantly at war with one another. Ship-to-ship -ship battles were common, making each expedition a perilous journey. Once an expedition arrived in the New World, the risks were equally as great. Many settlements faced a violent opposition from Native Americans. Some early colonies were completely wiped out by Native aggression or through misunderstandings caused by colonial ignorance. The United States was settled by one such corporation, the Massachusetts Bay Company, which King Charles I chartered in 1628 in order to colonize the New World for Great Britain. The practice of chartering companies was a crucial part in the establishment of colonies and the mercantile economic system practiced by the era's great powers of Holland, Spain, France, and England. In exchange for the charter, companies expanded their government's wealth and power by creating colonies that served both as source of raw materials and as markets for exported goods. Corporations like the British East India Company made their founding countries wealthy and powerful. In the 18th century, revolutionaries in America were inspired by the notions of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The American Revolution was fought not only to free the colonies from the grips of the English monarchy, but they also fought to be free of corporate institutions that the monarchy had chartered. For instance, the Boston Tea Party was a protest against the British East India Company's monopoly of the Eastern trade. After the Revolution, the country was expanding beyond the original 13 colonies. In order to build bridges, canals, public roads, and other essential infrastructure, the United States government 
or the states themselves chartered corporations to perform specific public work projects. That began to change in 1807 when President Thomas Jefferson ordered an embargo of both France and England, America's primary trading partners, in order to supply the country with manufactured goods that had previously come from Europe. American citizens formed corporations in order to amass the capital needed to fund the construction of factories and pay workers. These new corporations were no longer offshoots of government, but instead privately held entities created for purposes of profit. One of the most successful early corporate pioneers was Cornelius Vanderbilt. He was an American steamship and railroad builder, executive, financier, and promoter. At the age of 16, with a $100 loan from his mother, he opened a transport and freight service between New York City and Staten Island for 18 cents a trip. In 1818, Vanderbilt sold his interest in the freight service and turned his attention to steamboats. And by 1840, he was running more than 100 steamboats and his company had more employees than any other business in the United States. In the 1860s, Vanderbilt changed direction and invested his companies in the railroad. At his death in 1877, he was the richest man in America with a fortune of over $100 million. As the decades progressed, so did the influence of corporations. One of the turning points for the history of corporations was the American Civil War. Often seen as the first total war, both sides oriented their economies to a war footing. As American fought American in Shiloh, Antietam, Vicksburg, Gettysburg, and Atlanta, the need for railroads, arms, steel, pre-packed food, and other war-fighting essentials was clear. With millions of dollars of profit to be had, in order to build larger and more efficient factories, the corporation allowed for the concentration of capital while limiting the liability of investors. I had a friend named Ramblin' Bob He used to steal, gamble, and rob after the war, America was embroiled in the new industrial age, also known as the Gilded Age. It was a time of unbridled profiteering. The robber barons put the interests of profit over that of the public. One such robber baron was Philip Armour. He ran one of the largest corporations in the 19th century, Armour & Company. Armour & Company was the world's largest supplier of packed meat. He got his start during the Civil War by supplying the Union Army with pork. Like all robber barons of the day, Armour was interested in increasing profit, and he did so by increasing efficiency and lowering costs. Henry Ford wrote, in the disassembly lines of the Chicago Packers, he found the inspiration for the assembly line of his Model T. Although incredibly cruel and heartless and unsanitary, Armour's technique paid off for himself and investors. Along with Gustavus Swift, Armour formed the Meat Trust. In the mid-1880s, at the height of the Second Industrial Revolution, corporations were strengthened once again, this time by a ruling of the Supreme Court. In the case of Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, the Supreme Court while invoking the 14th Amendment, defined corporations as persons. Now considered persons, corporations were afforded the same constitutional rights that individuals enjoyed, and corporations would now acquire even more profit at the expense of the rest of America. While the corporations flourished, the average worker fell prey to the greed and avarice of the robber barons. Millions of Americans worked 12-hour days, seven days a week. Children worked in dangerous mills, and there was no minimum wage. 
while the wealthy lived in the lap of luxury and enjoyed ornate dining cars and lived in spectacular houses. Many workers lived in run-down tenement houses with no running water, while sewage flowed in the streets and no hope was in sight. A tension grew between labor and capital, and something had to give, and it did. The average working man and woman, tired of hopelessness, oppression, and exploitation, began to organize, and sometimes riots erupted. The corporate owners, in turn, hired private security forces and used violence and thuggery to put down the workers. At the turn of the century, when electricity was first reaching more and more Americans and the telephone connected people across the country, a new wave of reform was taking hold. Notably, President Roosevelt championed the reform of labor laws that limited the number of hours worked per day, created workmen compensation laws, and ensured safer working conditions. Thanks to corporate and governmental reform and the growth of organized labor, the average American worker had more time on their hands to enjoy with their families, more spending money to go to amusement parks or other forms of recreation, or to buy new items of convenience, like the automobile. Roosevelt was also the first president to call for the regulation of railroad companies. Such giants as J.P. Morgan's Northern Securities Company and John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Trust were targets for Roosevelt's trust busting. Critics called Roosevelt an overbearing power monger, while others applauded his service to the average American. As World War I erupted, American industrial might exploded with it. From this point forward, much of what the modern notion of what a corporation is was in place. Today, the corporation has become one of the most pervasive forces on earth. The power of corporations can be seen in our most modern cities, and it can even be seen from space. While the roots of the corporation harken back centuries, today they are an omnipresent aspect of modern life that touches every person on earth. It is without question that corporations have helped to propel mankind into the 21st century with incredible advances to help humanity. It is equally unquestioned that through the centuries and even today, the corporation has demeaned and abused workers while polluting and degrading our planet. By understanding the history of corporations, we can learn from our missteps and avoid the pitfalls that have befallen us in the past, and possibly achieve heights undreamed of even today.